Project Monroe, if you're listening on your headphones, what can you hear? Give me the news. Give me the scoop. Give me what you got. I want to see what you got. Can you hear my voice? Oh, there's a minute delay. All right, well, Monroe, in one minute, tell me if you can hear my voice.
Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Are we good? Perfect. So, uh, my name is Ben. Welcome to Top Talks. I'm uh, glad to see so many people showed up today. We've got a great talks lined up. Uh, we're going to learn a bit about evolutionary misconceptions with Chris and Kosa, and then learn a lot about uh, native Texas wildlife and rehabilitation after that with people from Nature's Out Wildlife. And, um, you know, as always, we have a bunch of trivia going up on the screen, so I encourage you all to participate. We have some fun prizes out in the back. Be sure to check us out on the table in the corner there. Um, in addition to the normal trivia games, we'll have like raffles. And so if you are interested, you know, you can either make donations to Top Talks, get these raffle prizes. Again, back on the table in the back over there, as well as all the cool Top Talks swag, you know, pint glasses, t-shirts, buttons, everything. Um, first talk will be starting in about 10, 15 minutes or so. So I encourage you all to get your drinks, settle in, and have a fun time. All right.
All right, everybody, it's time for the first talk. So can we have a warm welcome for Christian Colosso to tell us a bit about common evolutionary misconceptions. Thank you. Thank you. Kristen Kalsen, and I'm a scientist. I am a biological anthropology undergrad at UTA, and this is my first like public speaking, so I'm excited to find out how this goes. I am super excited to be here to explain some of the most common misconceptions about human evolution. Um, You might be wondering, um, just to clarify before we start, anthropology is, in fact, a science. And also, I used to think that I didn't look like a scientist either. Turns out, it is more about what you want to know than what you look like. But if some skeptic, some of my scientific experience includes field work, lab work, and education. Jumping right in, evolution is just a theory, not a fact. If there's anything that I've loved about human origins, it's that we can human evolution without first discussing what a scientific theory is. The implication of this statement is that humans either evolved or they didn't. friends who are always together. You will never see theory without their best friend fact. Biological anthropology and all anthropology subfields follow the scientific method. And the first step of the scientific method, of course, is observation. Observation is the fact. That's the verifiable truth. Human evolution, the theory of evolution, serves as a framework serves as a that is established on observation and supported by evidence. From a variety of scientific fields. Sometimes new discoveries are made new technology is developed, or advances in genetic testing might change how we thought we evolved, but it doesn't change the theory that we evolved. So why is evolution a theory and not a fact if we have mounds of evidence? In the same way that atomic theory is a theory, because scientists can't observe the particles because they're too small, human evolution, we take what we do see and connect the dots with an educated, I hate to say guess, <laughs> we connect the dots with what we think probably happened. Number two, evolution is random. There's a lot to unpack here. So, <laughs> natural selection is the sweetheart of evolutionary forces, but it's not the only mechanism for evolution. Natural selection doesn't have to do with intelligence. <laughs> this is awful, you guys. <laughs> um, Natural selection relies on random genetic mutation. So within there are some individuals who have more advantageous traits than others. And those individuals are more likely to survive, reproduce, and pass their advantageous traits on to the next generation. Over the course of many generations, the advantageous trait is the majority. 
So, if we have a population of black birds that like eating green bugs, and some of those green bugs have a random genetic mutation that causes them to be orange, and the birds don't eat the orange ones. Because the green guys keep getting eaten, there are more orange bugs to pass their advantageous trait on to the next generation, and over the course of many, 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 many generations, the population of green bugs is orange, and there's a population of birds that is hungry. The next evolutionary force is genetic drift. Genetic drift is playing error. So going back to bug population, <laughs> there is a population of green and brown bugs that are wandering around doing bug things. When somebody comes and accidentally steps in, randomly smushing all of the green bugs and probably a couple of the brown ones, which eliminates those bugs deep from the pool and be passed down. And gene flow is really the story of human evolution. If we, have, if we have a really wide river, and on one side of the river, we've got a small population of Homo sapiens. On the other side of the river, a small population of Homo neanderthalensis. The two populations don't have anything to do with one another on account of the big river. One of our sapiens migrate across the river and ultimately enter with the Neanderthal population introducing new genetic material into the Neanderthal gene pool. The resulting offspring of the sapiens creates a genetic link between the original sapiens population and the Neanderthal population. So if migration refers to the individual on the move, then gene flow refers to the genetic material. In and of itself, gene flow is random and but if it's advantageous in the new environment, it can be selected for in future generations. Number three, natural selection is a perfect solution. The genetic mutations that natural selection relies on are blind, and they happen all the time. Sometimes they're bad, sometimes they're neutral, occasionally they're good. But a trait that doesn't exist can be mutated. So a person can't have a smarter mutation if there's no smart trait. But also, natural selection has to work with natural selection has to work with the <laughs> see the thing is is like I know this really well. <laughs> So y'all are all watching and looking at me. <laughs> so maybe if we could like turn around for a second. No. <laughs> okay, so sometimes a population can't adapt quickly enough and so they end up going extinct, like these guys. But this section also has to work with the developmental patterns that have been established by distant ancestors, which is why flightless birds still have wings and Men have nipples. <laughs> no, they're, they're male nipples. <laughs> there is a lot of compromise in natural selection, in evolution. The human claim to fame is that our four-legged anatomy adapted to allow us to efficiently which would have provided several benefits. Walking on two legs is more energy efficient, so we could have traveled further to find food. Having our hands free meant that we could carry that food back to our group and share. Um, the downside is that it causes back pain, knee problems, and we now require assistance giving birth. So now 
description isn't perfect. Um, you know, by people it isn't perfect, but it's it's good enough. Humans are no longer evolved. So, there isn't really any reason to think that for the last four and a half billion years, all living things have been evolving, but now that we've leveled up to Homo sapiens, like we're done. That's it, we're out. Homo sapiens are going to keep genetically linking populations and random events are going to continue changing gene frequency. But with cultural advances like heat, food access, we face a lot of the shows that our ancestors had. So does natural selection even really have anything left to do? Yes, we still adapt for survival. Um, in most regions of the world, adults are lactose intolerant because the enzyme that produces, that, <laughs> that digests the milk, the sugar in milk, shuts down shortly after weaning. But in Europe, most adults tolerate lactose fine because they have random genetic mutation that prevents that enzyme from shutting down. It, it coincides with the domestication of milk producing farm animals in Europe. So it may have been safer than drinking water or it may have prevented starvation during times of when the crops failed. Whatever the case, um, individuals with this genetic mutation because it provided some kind of evolutionary advantage. Humans are more evolved than other animals. I actually, I really love this one. So we have to figure out an assessment area first. If we were to go by best suited for survival in a saltwater environment, we would lose. Um, if we look at length of existence, it's hard to pinpoint exactly when a species began. But we could say that Homo sapiens have been around for roughly 300,000 years, a little more. That's really not very long, all species considered. <laughs> if I'm being entirely honest here, um, The guys who can no longer survive without the material culture that they created kind of painted themselves into the corner and maybe shouldn't be at the top of any most of all lists. Um, evolution is just a change. It's only a change in heritable characteristics. Every species that is alive today is best adapted for its environment. But really, just remember, humans are not the pinnacle of evolutionary progress. We are just the parent side branch of fish evolution. The perennial classic. If I descended from my grandfather, why are my cousins still alive? Homo sapiens did not evolve from modern apes. Modern apes are not going to eventually evolve into Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens are modern apes. And common ancestor, ape ancestor, are the modern apes. So you can think of the modern apes as like a like third or fourth cousin, which really doesn't seem like that much of a stretch. blame most of the misconceptions on this linear image. It really and then some. The insinuation here is that evolution is has a beginning and an end, and it's a progression from simple to modern or <laughs> to perfect. And we have 
what looks like maybe an ape that shapeshifts into an ape man who shapeshifts into a caveman, who then shapeshifts, and here we are. This image really leaves out all of the five points of Darwin's theory. All species evolve at different rates. It's an, it's an achingly slow process. Evolution is subtle, and it's so subtle that we can't see it while it's happening. There is no distinct beginning or end to a species. And it generally happens by splitting. So, selection, <laughs> gene flow, and genetic drift make evolution look like a braided stream, straight line. At some point, our earliest ancestors split into two different groups. One of the groups stayed in an environment where it was more beneficial for their survival to be in the trees. The other group lived in an environment where it was more beneficial to walk on two legs. Over the course of roughly eight million years, populations repeatedly split, adapted, evolved, gene flow, some died out, genetic drifting, and it ultimately resulted in gorillas, bonobos, orangutans, homo sapiens, and chimpanzees. Which we have there. <laughs> I can answer questions. <laughs> um, I am qualified to answer questions because I, you know, I, for the same time I hit on the highlights, but also, <laughs> So the trivia is going to go by a couple times. Um, this is a quick note also. We have the two main talks today, so be sure to get your trivia forms in before the beginning of the next talk. All right. Um, great. So get some drinks, get some food.
Hi everybody, let's make a quick announcement real quick. Be sure to not touch the owl, do not touch the owl. Keep your hands to yourself away from the owl. Also, one, one more thing. Be careful when you stand near the projector. Try not to jostle it or to move it. Okay, everybody, so we're going to let the trivia do one full more round after this. So it will go from seven minutes out right now to ten, and then one through ten again. And then after that, make sure you get your forms turned in. So a um, couple things then. Uh, if you're over here to look at the snakes, if you will just try to stay out of the view of the projector. And if you're missing any questions after the next round, you know, come and find one of us in the book shorts, and we can help you out. But, Pay attention for the next round of the trivia, because that'll be the last.
Move on to the next uh, item on our schedule here with Randy and Mario Nickerson from Nature's Edge Wildlife and Reptile Reserve. So if we get a warm tap talks, welcome to them as we move on to the next talk. Okay. Wants to... Sure. All right, guys. First thing I want to say is can we get a round of applause for our first speaker again? I understand it was your first talk. Let me tell you, I've done thousands of these. It never gets easier. When you feel comfortable, find a new audience. Anyway. Hey, you need to either go that way or this way. You have to That's just a logo. All right, so my name is Mario. This is Brandy. We're with Nature's Edge Wildlife and Reptile Rescue. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, state and federally permitted wildlife rescue. We also deal with exotic reptiles as well as a whole bunch of different animals. Which one goes forward? Let's see. There we go. So here's what we do. I'm going to stand over here because I keep getting blinded by that. There we go. Now I can see. All right, so primarily what we do in our rescue is we deal with predators. What kind of predators do we deal with? We deal with birds of prey. We deal with mammals. Uh, most of the mammals that we deal with are going to be bobcats, coyotes, foxes, predators. We also deal with small mammals. Uh, raccoons are one we don't normally deal with unless it's an emergency. Same with skunks. We deal with opossums. We deal with squirrels. We deal with songbirds on occasion. We also deal with shorebirds and waterfowl. It's really not much we don't do. Uh, we also do deer. Uh, we do deer for about five or six different counties around Tarrant area. As far as reptiles, we're one of the few that's permitted for nuisance wildlife as far as gators. There's only a couple of us. Uh, there's us in the Fort Worth Nature Center. When we start talking about nuisance, we start talking about dumped pets. This one had an interesting story. As you can see, it's in a mud pit. We were driving down the road, saw a couple cops on the side of the road throwing rocks at a fence by the Nature Center. Boo. Exactly. <laughs> So out of nothing more than morbid curiosity, we stopped to see what a couple of cops were throwing rocks at. Lo and behold, it was somebody's illegally dumped illegal pet gator. Yes, we had to contain it and capture it for the game wardens when they finally showed up because they were afraid of it. Not very big, but you can see they still wound up hog tying it. Why? Because they wouldn't listen. This guy, unfortunately, got illegally released out into Lake Worth. Luckily, we have native gators here. Uh, anybody in the area ever seen a gator in the wild? They're here. Over by the Nature Center, you'll see a, a bunch of them if you actually look hard. Uh, I say that. I've never seen one in the wild. I've caught nuisance, but I've never just come up on one. So we're one of two that do gators, along with venomous snakes, and yes, we do songbirds. I do want to stop for a second and, and point out that possession of any native animal is illegal without a permit. If you have one, it's to get it to a rehabber that is permitted as soon as possible. There are specific reasons for that. This is one such reason. Can I add something just before we go on? Um, a lot of these slides that are coming up uh, will explain the reason why we believe in doing wildlife rehab. Uh, most of what comes into us is because of humans. Um, it's not, oh, you know, here's just an animal and rehab it. Almost, I would say probably 90% or better of the animals, the wild animals that come to us are because of, of human reasons. And that's where this is going to start, uh, is some of the reasons why uh, they do come into rehab. And this one is the first one, like you said, Northern Mockingbird. 
Uh, these guys, we actually had two. They were kept for several weeks by someone who didn't know how to properly care for them. And this is the result of what we got from them. So you can see in the slide all the way on the left side here, this bird's got an extremely soft beak. Middle slide, you can see they actually don't line up. And what we're showing on that far side over there is actually there's multiple, multiple breaks in the bones. Um, those are the, the legs, obviously. Birds are very, very fragile. Uh, they can be messed up in literally a day if they're fed improperly. You'll see a lot of stuff online that says feed them this or feed them that. It's not feed the case. Dog food. Dog food. Uh, there's lots of studies that show stuff like that is actually bad for them, especially if it's a bug eater. They would eat bugs. Uh, we get a lot of times people bring us animals. I kid you not, yogurt mixed with heavy cream mixed with scrambled eggs. I'm not sure about you, but I have yet to be walking through the woods and come up across a bunch of birds at a campfire. Doesn't happen. Raw eggs, I can understand. Cooked eggs, I can't. Um, but feeding the wrong diet can really screw up a bird fast. Um, you'll hear it if you call a rehabber, you'll hear it if you call us, and I'll say it now. Only thing you do when you find any injured animal box with a lid or a carrier with a door, keep it quiet and warm, no food, no water. The no food, no water is very critical. We have any first responders, nurses, anything like that in here? I saw one hand in the back. Anybody ever gone to the doctor and seen the signs right on the wall that says, please don't eat or drink anything until you see the doctor? There's a reason for that. If you shove a bunch of food or water into an animal, guess what we can't do? Can't do any kind of surgeries, can't intubate, can't do anything like that for fear of aspiration, fear of them throwing up and getting liquid in their lungs. So, we also deal with reptiles, as I said. I will warn you, some of these slides can be a little harder to watch and look at if you know what you're looking at. This is a brown batted copperhead. This is one somebody tried to keep as a pet. Yes, they can be kept as pets, but what you see here is somebody decided to rip the fangs out. I had the same response when they brought it to me. They brought it to us because it was losing weight and it was thin and they couldn't get it to eat. Well, yeah, you ripped its fangs out and it got an infection in the gums. The other part of that story is fangs grow back. They shed their fangs on a regular basis, just like sharks. All snakes do. So those fangs are gonna grow back anyway. But at this point, we had to treat the animal for infection. Then once it started getting fangs and we got it eating, we had to keep it long enough to get weight back on it before it could be released. I'll let Brandy talk about bats. <laughs> I added this just because it's cute. Um, I love bats. Uh, I've been doing rehab for over 20 years. Uh, I went to A&M, got a degree in wildlife ecology and management. Uh, bats, I had a friend that did uh, a paper on bats when we were in our undergrad, uh, went to a did a summer internship and she worked on bats. I worked on something else, but I helped her a lot, so I became a total bat lover. Uh, so this is just one because I like bats. Um, but it is amazing. Uh, that little guy you can see, this is my thumb. So it's about the size of my thumb. But look at those teeth. It's amazing how sharp those are. And they're like razors. They can still go through that glove and bite and draw blood. Um, bats are amazing critters. Uh, they don't have rabies like everybody thinks they do. Um, but like I said, I just added this because I like bats. So. And I do have my pre-exposure shots, so yes, I handle all the rabies vector species that come into the rescue because Mario does not have his vaccines. All right. Who, who was taking pictures earlier? I mentioned that eye shot. There's, there's what I was talking about. You can see just 
the amazing eyes on these guys. This is a great horned owl. This one we actually pulled out of a chicken coop. Uh, they go into uh, coops a lot because they just don't really understand why, hey, all these birds, this food is sitting here. <laughs> For free. Anybody, anybody ever heard the term wise old owl? Don't believe it. Owls are dumb as a box of rocks. The reason for that, they have really big eyes. There's no room for a brain left. You're offending Moon Pie. Yeah, I'm offending Moon Pie. They have really big eyes. What you don't see here is the back of the eye. Owls have really cool ears. They're open, similar to ours. And you can actually lift this dark flap down the side here. Right here. And you can pull it forward a little bit, and you can actually look into their ear. What you see is the back of their eyeball. Very big eyes. What's really unique about these guys is they don't have peripheral vision like we do. They don't see anything beside them, which is why they get hit by cars a lot, because they're flying down the road, they can't see that truck coming at them. We do a lot of owls. We get a lot of owls in every year. Remember I said we do reptiles too, right? We're one of a few that are actually permitted for native reptiles. This situation, homeowner found a turtle stuck in a uh, landscaping drain, and it took us about three hours to cut that animal out. They had no idea how they got there. They thought it went in the box, went in the pipe, turned around somehow, and got stuck. No, it had burrowed underground and got in through a busted pipe. But so we wound up working on that one for about three hours to get that animal out to simply take it down the road and re-release it. So we get lots of calls during baby season. These are eastern screech owls, which is what moon pie is over here on the perch. Uh, before I get asked 15 times tonight, yes, moon pie is an adult. Moon pie is nine years old. Just like there's little dogs and little cats, there's little birds and big birds. The difference is, big bird is yellow. Thank you. Don't laugh. Dad joke for the night. Don't encourage him. Please don't encourage him. So a lot of times we get calls for baby birds on the ground. Yes, they can be re-nested. No, you don't have to know where the original nest is. We got lucky with this one. We went out to look. This was in our own neighborhood. We had a couple of baby screech owls on the ground, looked around, mom and dad were in the tree above us. They were watching their babies. No reason for us to take the babies. So we did what anybody would do. We grabbed an aluminum ladder, climbed That's up one into of the adults right there. Yep, there's there's one of the adults. We grabbed a shaky aluminum ladder, popped it up against a four foot chain link fence, stupidly climbed up into a tree and hung a milk crate. I had fun doing it. We left them there, homeowner watched them, mom and dad continued to raise their babies. Boom, we don't have to take them home. So yes, if you call a rehabber and they ask you to remest, there is simple ways to do it. Milk crates, uh, you can use gallon milk jugs cut out, drainage holes cut in them. Uh, old Easter baskets work great. Tupperware, egg crate baskets, so do uh, hanging plant baskets, because they have drainage holes, and you can hang them, so they're very easy to use. Most of the time during baby season, when people call us uh, with baby birds, the first thing I do is send them a link to a YouTube video we did that explains how to re-nest baby birds and where to re-nest them. So it's actually really easy to do. Uh, we've actually done it in a Walmart parking lot with a cardboard box. People looked at us weird, but we did it. It's probably because we were standing on top of our Suburban. All right, so snakes. This one's a little more difficult to watch. This is actually a live video. How do I get Can it to play? Can you press play? So this is a bull snake. Uh, we get lots of bull snakes in. This was one not far from our house. Somebody had called us. They were afraid. They found a snake. They thought it was a rattlesnake. We were already on the way. We were 10 minutes away, as was somebody else. They decided to hit it with a couple of cans of wasp spray. Very toxic. 
What you're going to see in the video is these are muscle spasms and neurological symptoms. This is seven minutes after that animal was sprayed. Needless to say, we made several phone calls. Uh, we had the active ingredient of the wasp spray. We called poison control. We called our vet. Luckily, we had the right muscle relaxer on hand, but there was no dosage instructions for reptiles. Nobody ever thought of it. Uh, dog, cat, human, sure. So we had to make an educated guess. We shot it up with enough to either stop the spasms or euthanize the animal. Luckily, they survived. We were able to save that one. This is, this is, these are the stories that we like to share. It's not, I'm sorry, it's not all butterflies and rainbows. I wish it was. Nature is not Disney. I have never sung a song and had antelope run into my house and start cleaning. I wish. Okay, so this is some of what we do and why we do it. So there we go. Hurricane Harvey. Man, that was a mess. We got calls from down south. A uh, bunch of rehabbers were flooded. No power. No way to get supplies. The supplies they did have were ruined. Uh, we put the call out to a bunch of different rehabbers as well as the community here in Fort Worth and said, please, we need to help these people. Um, so we drove down, or Brandy drove down, with a volunteer of ours, and that's our suburban packed front to back with animals. This is what our living room and kitchen looked like at one in the morning when she got back. We started unloading animals. We took opossums, skunks, here. I just want to say something. Um, we learned the hard way never to put opossums in cat boxes um, because they chew. We were literally driving down the road, and our friend uh, John that went with us, because uh, obviously I didn't want to drive down to Houston in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey by myself because I had no idea what I was getting into. Uh, but John is our friend and our volunteer, but he is mostly a snake and a reptile person. He doesn't deal with mammals. So we're driving down the highway. I'm pulling a trailer, got our Suburban completely packed with animals, and all of a sudden he just looks over and he's like, Brandy? Um, something just bit me on the neck and he was like calm as calm as I'll be and I look over and there's an almost adult opossum sitting on his shoulder that had just bitten him hilarious um but yeah so we had I think what five six get loose in our house so it us two days to find one of them yeah so we took in squirrels we took in all kinds of stuff uh, those little uh, boxes, the little white boxes in the big brown cardboard box, those are squirrel babies, probably five or six in each one of those. Here's what we took in from Hurricane Harvey. We did not keep all of that. Please understand that. Some of this got released right away that was ready to be released. They couldn't release it ahead of the storms. Um, some of this was taken by other rehabbers. 233 animals total were transported up from Houston and the coast. Now, that bottom right, that trailer, that was supplies we took back down. That's what people donated. Um, some of it was simple, laundry detergent. Some of the stuff that we would think, hey, I'll just get on Amazon and order it and have it delivered to them. FedEx couldn't deliver it. UPS couldn't deliver it. They were shut down for weeks. So some of it was simple stuff. There was a deer rehabber down there. Her, deers, her deer were fine. They were on high ground, but all her feed was ruined. She couldn't even get hay. So we took you know five or six bales down to her, got her through. So it's not always about us, but sometimes it is about illegal animals. For anybody that's ever seen an adult opossum should be shocked by these pictures. These were two opossums kept as pets. This is a male and female. They are probably three times the size they should be. They are very, very, very obese. These animals, their lifespan was cut short. 
um, opossums only live two to three years anyway. And that's in captivity. Uh, yeah, these guys didn't make it a full six months with us before we lost one of them. They both went on diets immediately. Uh, this was a situation, a game warden found somebody in possession of two pet opossums. Um, we took them in, they came and lived with us. Uh, these two animals actually sat in our living room in giant cages till the day they both passed away. And that was just because we couldn't do anything else with them. Um, so you can see just the fat rolls on them. This is what happens when you don't feed animals properly. These things were getting little Debbie snack cakes, and they were cooking for them, and pancakes, and you name it. All right, so we talked about nature earlier. This is, this is a situation of sometimes animals just don't know what's happening. This is an osprey that got caught on a methane burn stack. Um, I believe this one was at a landfill. But what you see is all the feathers melted off that bird, basically. Um, that bird got transferred to us from the coast right after Hurricane Harvey, uh, just because they, even though we took all those animals, all those rehabbers were still getting animals in nonstop. So critical animals still were coming up to us. Uh, this one was with us for a while. Unfortunately, it did not make it. But this is man-made issue right here. This is man-made 101. Methane torch, not protected. Animals can't see those flames. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen methane flames. They're basically clear with a little blue hint. These guys have no idea what they're landing on them. Um, Red Salt Hawk electrocuted. Uh, unfortunately, power poles, again, man-made. We do have issues uh, occasionally with properly insulated, unproperly insulated poles shocking birds. A lot of times what you see is like down here in the bottom, that's where it went in through the foot when they landed. The other is out through the wing. Those are the wing feathers. Uh, just tra electricity travels through the body, shoots out the other side. Typically when they touch two wires, bird drops to the ground. I do want you to know, if you do find a bird in that situation, we've had birds brought to us that have been caught on fire, electrocuted, all kinds of things from poles. By law, the power companies do have to fix those poles. If you ever drive around and you see those poles that have the little triangles on them between wires or the little T-perch above the pole, that's a pole that the power company has fixed because of something like this. So if you do see something like this, every pole has a tag on it, metal tag with the number on it. You take that number and you report it to Encore and they will get somebody out to fix the poles. I will say about 90% of the birds that get electrocuted like that, if we don't get them right away, it's a death sentence. Yes, birds are still shot. Um, the only thing I can say on that is all migratory birds are federally protected. You cannot shoot them just because they're harassing your chickens. This one, the homeowner actually saw somebody shoot it in their front yard. Guy pulled up on the street, pulled out a rifle, shot the hawk, drove off. Why? Nobody knows. We were able to save this bird and return it back to where it was because it was also breeding season. So we were worried about mates. We were worried about potential babies out there. Luckily, no major damage from this. Um, you can see we wrapped the wing, got it stable, got the hole patched up, everything good. Did some rehab on it and got it back out. That was a great success story. Again, man-made issue. Here's another one with chickens and other livestock. This was a red-shouldered hawk. Both legs snapped at the feet. Leg hold trap on top of a utility pole. Uh, you can also see this bird at some point was shot. Those two little bright spots, those are pellets. We didn't x-ray the body because we were worried about the feet, but I guarantee you if we had x-rayed the body, we probably would have found pellets through there. Nothing can be done for a bird like this. It had to be euthanized. 
Uh, it's a sad aspect of it, but you can't fix them all. All right. Anybody here keep chickens? Do you keep fake eggs or golf balls in your chicken coop? Thank God. This is what happens when people keep fake eggs in their chicken coop. The reason people keep fake eggs is to teach their chickens where to lay their eggs, because chickens are dumb and they don't know where to lay their eggs. Unfortunately, snakes get into the coop. They don't know the difference between a fake egg and a real egg, because they're all hot and smell like chicken butt. So they eat them. Unfortunately, it's a death sentence. They can't get them back up. They can't regurgitate them. They can't digest them. They're solid ceramic blocks, basically. We drove all the way out to Tyler, Texas to pull that snake out of a chicken coop and work those eggs up. So what you can see Brandy holding on that far side over there is three ceramic eggs we pulled out of that snake. You have to do it very, very carefully. Uh, you will see videos from time to time on Facebook of vets did surgery to remove this or remove that. Depending on what it is, I can tell you 90% of the time, if you catch it early enough, it's a 10 minute fix with no surgery. We hold the snake for a couple of days to make sure nothing ripped, nothing tore, give it a good meal for its problems and send it back on its way. All right, I have to touch base on glue traps. Glue traps are terrible. I understand they serve a purpose, but they're indiscriminate killers and they're slow torture killers. And when I say they're indiscriminate killers, most people put these out for bugs or rodents. The trap on the far side over there, that's an industrial grade trap. We normally put out by pest control companies. If you look closely on that trap, you'll notice not only are there bugs, there's a snake and a lizard. Okay, we were not able to save the lizard, we were able to save the snake. Uh, same with the top one, that's a homeowner trap. Uh, typically bought, Home Depot, Lowe's. Um, spiders, obviously they're trying to catch, but also snakes. Um, if you do happen to use these, all I can say is please check them two or three times a day. If something's on there that's not supposed to be, carefully coat the whole trap in olive oil, veggie oil, any kind of edible oil. You will see online that people say to use baby oil or mineral oil. I'm here to tell you, baby oil and mineral oil are not edible. Don't do it. Um, if you do happen to catch a bird on these, please don't try to remove it. Get the entire trap to a rehabber. If you do it wrong, you wind up ripping out feathers. Now that bird has to stay in rehab for possibly up to a year, and that's if the feathers grow back. So if you do manage to catch a bird, please just get the whole trap to a rehabber. All right, opossums. I think these are one of Brandy's favorite ones to rehab. Opossums are cute. They are great to work with. Honestly, I see the draw of people wanting to keep them as pets. I really do. They're cute little buggers. They eat just about everything. They hang upside down. No, no they don't. <laughs> they climb upside down. Let me correct that. Despite what you see in movies, they do not hang by their tail. While their tail is prehensile, meaning they grab stuff with it, they don't hang from it. Um, it would actually hurt them. Uh, they are our only marsupial as far as that goes. They can have up to 22 babies. The first 13 to attach to teats are the first to survive. Everything else gets reabsorbed by the mom. Now I will tell you this, we hear it every year, people say, Hey, I bottle fed one of those as a baby. No, you didn't. Opossums are a very unique animal in as they do not suckle. Mom's teat goes all the way down into their stomach and she pumps milk into them. So they do not suckle. You can take a baby, you can put a nipple in its mouth and it won't have a clue what to do. It will drown. Squirrels. Squirrels are fun to do too. They are very unique characters. They do have a bad rap. They're not tree rats. They're actually very cool. Um, 
Which one? So the far one on the right, you can see it's it's eating over there. Yes, they do eat at people's bird feeders, stuff like that. If you do want to feed them, uh, feed them appropriate food. A lot of people put out corn. Uh, corn does to them the same thing it does to us. We're not meant to digest it properly. There's not a lot of nutrition in it. Um, so pumpkin seeds, hard nuts, stuff like that. All right, <laughs> baby birds. We are one of the few in the area, there's only about five of us that deal with raptors. Um, these are probably some of our favorite to work with. Eastern screech owls on the top. The bottom one is actually a pretty cool story. Those are American kestrels, uh, smallest falcon in North America. Those were actually found in a mailbox at a closed business. A uh, security guard found them. Kids were messing with the mailbox. He went over to look. He thought they were hungry, so he threw a pretzel in there. I, OK. Um, Anybody know what this top left bird is? What? Not a kingfisher. That's actually a really cool bird of prey called a crested caracara. They are expanding their range. You can see them on occasion up here in the Metroplex. No, they are not the Mexican eagle. We hear that all the time. They're not the Mexican eagle. Mexican eagle is the golden eagle. Okay, that's a caracara, very smart falcon, um, and it's one of the very few species of birds of prey that actually eat fruit as a normal part of their diet. They spend a lot of time on the ground. They'll actually follow other vultures around. They'll eat a lot of roadkill, but they'll also go over and flip over cow patties and eat all the bugs underneath. They're very smart birds. Uh, there's a few more of some of the favorite stuff that we've done. Foxes, Mississippi kites, turtles. More baby birds. Like I said, we do songbirds on occasion. Uh, we normally try to push songbirds off on other bird rehabbers. Saves room for birds of prey for us. I do want to point out that top bird up there. That is an Inca dove. Yes, that is a quarter next to it. That bird is probably about a third of the way grown. Inca doves are very, very small doves. We do have them in the area. Uh, most people never get lucky enough to see one. We do exotics, as I said. Yes, we do peacocks on occasion. We probably get six peacocks in a year. Um, everything from pigs, uh, tortoise on the bottom down there. That's actually one of our first rescues together. Um, we've had him 10, 12 years now. He's about 140 pounds. 10 years. We got him in August 2011. There you go. And of course, uh, we would be remiss. We can't do this by ourselves. We really can't. It takes a lot of volunteers. It takes a lot of people to support us, uh, whether it's transporting animals, donations, wish lists, events like this. So this was after an event. We took a bunch of our volunteers out, and we had steaks and shake. All right. So one thing I want to add about uh, wildlife rehabilitators, uh, about 90, probably 99% of us do this out of our homes. Uh, in the DFW area, there's over 200 rehabbers and sub-permitted rehabbers, and there's only two centers. Uh, we do this out of our home. Mario works a full-time job. I do this full-time. We take in about 2,500 animals a year. Um, nobody helps us at home. We get volunteers that help us uh, with transport and at education events and adoption events, but that's it. So when you're trying to call a rehabber, be patient. Uh, keep in mind that this isn't our job. We do this out of our own pocket, and we do this because we love animals. So I just wanted to uh, reiterate that uh, a lot of people think it's our job and will call us and say, hey, you need to come do this because it's your job, and it, it, it's not. We do this because we love it. Um, so what Mario is holding is Bob. It's our infamous turkey vulture. Um, it is a she, and her name is Bob. When we first uh, got her, uh, what was it, five years ago? Six, five years ago? 2015. So it's been six years. Um, she 
we were getting calls from White Settlement Animal Control that there was a vulture that was basically hanging out in the neighborhood. Um, they finally called us about three weeks later and said, hey, this vulture is literally at the uh, middle school football um, tryouts and stuff. So or, uh, they were practicing said, can you please come get this bird? Because it's walking up to everybody. So we went and got the bird. Um, found out a couple of weeks later that someone, we could tell by the way she was acting that she had been raised illegally by someone. Uh, ended up finding out who it was. They uh, took her as a chick, vulture's nest on the ground. So he found it on the ground, took it home. When she started to become aggressive, he just threw it outside. Unfortunately, because she was not fed a proper diet, um, and we think a lot of her diet was dry dog food, because when she, when we first got her, when we would put dog food in the dog bowl, she would come running uh, just by the sound alone. Um, but she can't fly very well. She can fly enough to get up about 10 or 12 feet, but she can't get uh, lift high enough or travel for long distances. So she can't be released back to the wild. Um, we thought she was a male. We got her DNA sexed. It was a female, so we still call her Bob. We just changed it to little B, little O, big B. Um, so we just reversed her name. But she is Mario's bird. She hates me. She will bite me she's she hates my guts um this, this is a bird that we would call an imprint she doesn't necessarily understand she's a vulture uh she thinks she's just a really screwed up human and she wonders why i don't have feathers um she does try to preen me on occasion she's okay with me uh she does help us with the rescue um she does help us with keeping other vultures entertained so to speak, uh, teaching them how to vulture even though she doesn't know she's doing it. Um, this is what happens when people illegally keep wildlife. This is one that we bring out for education. We honestly have four more imprints at home that like we just can't find placement for yet. There's not a lot of homes for birds that people don't understand. So has any... <laughs> Because we were talking about, this is science night, right? Anybody know what a buzzard is? Is this a buzzard? This is not a buzzard. We call them buzzards, but they're not buzzards. They're vultures. Buzzards are technically hawks. But we only have three true hawks in the United States. Cooper's hawk, goss hawk, sharp shin hawk. Well, we call hawks, red-tailed hawks, red-shouldered hawks, those are buzzards. Technically, their name is red-tailed buzzard. Easiest way to think about it. Do we have buffalo or bison in the United States? Bison. We call them buffalo, right? They're not buffalo. Technically, they're not bison either. They're tatanka if we really want to think about it. Okay? So, what happened is when the settlers came over, they saw birds soaring, and they went, look, a buzzard, because that's what they had back home. So just another thing with names, commonly wrong names are used in a lot of things, OK? I do want to point out the little guy on the pole perch here, Eastern Screech Owl. Yes, that is full grown, OK? Um, moon pie was found after a storm. Somebody kept her illegally. Didn't know what they were doing, tried to rehab it themselves, and unfortunately, Moon Pie can't fly well. All right, guys, we do have live animals here. We do have some live snakes up here. We have snakes that you would normally see in this area, okay? Yes, they are alive. Please don't tap on the tops. Please don't scare the snakes, because guess what's gonna happen? One of them's gonna strike at it and scare you, and you're gonna scream, and then I'm gonna giggle, and there we go. So please come up, ask questions, see animals. I know we talked probably way too long, but I can talk all day about animals. Uh, feel free to take pictures of anything. Please do not touch the birds. They do touch back, uh, especially Bob. She will bite you and it does hurt. Um, but also our uh, oils on our 
hands can damage their feathers and cause their uh, waterproofing to be destroyed. So you don't want to, uh, you know, if everybody was touching the birds, then it would mess up their feathers. So feel free to take pictures. Feel free to ask questions. We are always happy to um, answer any questions. Uh, like Mario said, don't tap on the uh, snake cages. Um, and all the snakes that you that are here can be found here in Tarrant County. And we just brought a small sampling because this was, you know, supposed to be a short talk. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's not in our purview. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. Now, is there a question in the back over there? Um, my question is, you guys are wonderful. How can we make a donation? We are a 501c3. Um, we operate on donations and what Mario brings in, because all of our extra money is spent on the animals. Uh, we take PayPal. Um, you can give us money here. We have uh, Venmo. We have Omela. Um, all of our stuff is on our website or our Facebook page. Easy to Google us, Nature's Edge Wildlife Rescue, and that'll come up. Thank, Thank you very much. We appreciate that question. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a question over here. Uh, so you mentioned that you can't bottle feed an opossum. So what do you do if you have an orphaned opossum? Uh, well, for any wildlife, what you need to do, like Mario said, is put it in a box with a lid, keep it warm and quiet, no food, no water, and call a rehabber. We personally have to tube feed opossums. Uh, so we have to put a tube down their throat, into their stomach, and, and feed them that way. Uh, that's the only way to feed an opossum until they're old enough to actually be able to lap. Hi, I have a question. So, um, when you, if you find like an animal and you call around and ask like, oh, where should I bring this bird or wherever, like, if they tell you to bring it to somebody, how do you know that they're like legit and have like the certifications? like to be able to take care of that animal. Okay, so there are several resources that you can use. Texas Parks and Wildlife has a list of rehabbers. Unfortunately, it's not an exhaustive list. It's not a complete list. Uh, a lot of rehabbers aren't listed because they don't, they don't have the means to be able to take in a lot of animals. Um, most rehabbers do less, maybe 50 animals a year, 50 to 100, um, because they work full-time jobs or... You know, they just don't have the facilities. Uh, if you call us, and we have our cards on the table, if you call us, if we're not the closest rehabber or if it's an animal we don't take, uh, like raccoons and skunks, uh, then we will refer you to a permitted rehabber. There's also an app called Animal Help Now. You can download that app to your phone or go to their website, put in your address, um, so if you're out of town, not in the DFW area, you can put in your address, and that will bring up rehabbers close to you. Uh, it may not be something that's very, very close, but you can always call them, and a lot of times they have sub-permitted rehabbers or no rehabbers that may be closer to you that take the animal that you have. But you can always call us, and we can help direct you, and we would never give you someone that wasn't permitted. Yeah, you can always ask a rehabber to see their permit. I have been asked. I keep shortcuts on my phone to PDFs. I just pull them right up. And there you go. And it also works with the game warden to stop us. Here, here's my permit. <laughs> so it just works out. You can always feel free to ask somebody. If they can't provide permits, walk away with the animal, find something they can. Did you have a question? So I had two questions, and the first one is you talked about renesting baby birds. Um, 
I've always heard you're not supposed to handle them. Do you? How do y'all? Do you use tongs? That's how a myth. You, That's an absolute myth. Almost all animals, if you touch them, the parents will take them back. It'd be like you taking your child to Walmart and me coming up and, hey, oh, you have such a cute kid. And then you'd be like, oh, my God, it smells like you. I'm not going to take it back. It's an absolute myth. The only thing we can think of is, is, you know, people invented that to keep their kids from touching animals that they find. Say, oh, my gosh, if you touch that, then the mommy won't take it back. That's the only thing I can think of that makes sense you can re-nest squirrels uh opossums you can't re-nest Parent, mom won't come back for for opossums because they're nomadic but squirrels raccoons skunks uh baby birds almost all baby birds can be re-nested uh birds of prey are a little different so call a rehabber they can instruct you per what specific birds you have like mississippi kites re-nesting doesn't work um but you can touch it but if you feel more comfortable you can always wear gloves i mean that's not a problem okay the other quick question is kind of related to the buzzard vulture thing um i was under the impression that what like that falcons were not in our area but hawks were in our area but it sounds like we have falcons and not hawks or are they we the have everything thing? we have so falcons is a specific family group um hawks are a specific family group um buzzards are a specific family group vultures are a specific family group uh, we have two vultures in north america uh, we have the turkey vulture and the black vulture they're actually in in two separate uh uh genuses um they're not even related so that's a cooper's hawk um so and hawk is a is a loose term we do have falcons here we have the american kestrel it's the smallest falcon in north america which is this guy here um so we have them that that are in the area all year but then we also get tons of migrating birds uh we've had merlins brought in which are a falcon we've had um peregrine falcons brought in which are a falcon so it just kind of depends on which area you're in so we do have falcons we have hawks we have vultures we have owls um, we also have kites here so we have a, a a very large range plus we're in the main migratory route for a lot of species so you're very welcome yes sir hi there uh so anyone who lives in texas and owns a chimney uh, is well aware of the fact that chimney uh, swifts <laughs> chimney can be swifts, yep. a little annoying. Um, but <laughs> is there anything we can do? Because obviously they're endangered. They struggle to find their natural resting or their roosting areas. Is there anything we as like citizens can do to like give them something that they could rest in? Or is there like a better way to handle? Because obviously you can't just remove them. That's dangerous. They don't really have an opportunity to well, do it that way. So there's. There's different laws regarding birds. Um, if it's during the summer and a chimney swift is nesting in your chimney and you call U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and say, hey, I have these birds nesting in my chimney. I live in Texas. They're going to laugh at you if you say, I need to get rid of them because yeah. obviously you're not going to use your chimney. Best thing to do is to cap your chimney so they can't nest there for the next year. Yep. You know, and that includes any species. You can deter species from nesting in your area but once a nest becomes active i.e the parents are sitting on it or there are eggs present or babies present you can't touch it if yeah. it's a native migratory bird there's only four birds that are migratory that aren't protected uh and those are all invasive species okay. and that's uh the english house sparrow european starlings colored doves and um pigeons uh, we do have native pigeons but most of the pigeons we see are not protected everything else is protected grackles crows um, herons everything else so the best thing to do is to try to deter any species that you don't want to to be there um, if you catch them building a nest like barn swallows you can tear it down as they're building but once it becomes an active nest you can't touch it um, there are uh things that people build for chimney swifts and if you google chimney swift uh nesting they're like literally big um 
They look like a, yeah. They also they almost look like a chimney. Okay. But you can you can build those to help them um, to encourage them to yeah. to breed. To I mean that's that's what I was more interested there. in. Yeah. Just like. Mm-hmm. I mean yeah. My just first, like you yeah. can have owl boxes and yeah. bluebird boxes and all that stuff. So. It's not going to work yet. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a chimney, bo- uh, chimney topper, so I'm not worried about, like, getting them. I was more thinking about helping them. Yep, yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Any other questions? And you guys can come up and ask us individually. That's fine. We'll stay as as long as y'all want us to. Well, or until we get kicked out. Can we, thank you so much. Can we get another round of applause for Danny and Mario? <laughs> okay. So now we are going to move on to the winners of the trivia. Just a moment. <laughs> Now, before I start going over these, I want to remind everybody that we do have a raffle, too. And so if you want to participate in the raffle, you have like two ways. Either you can go back to the table over there and show that you're following us on social media. Uh, and that, that way I can get you a couple tickets. Or you can make donations to Tap Talk so we can keep doing these events. Uh, just right back over in the back. You can see some people waving some things around. Raffle tickets, trivia, raffle prizes. All right. And you got all the time during the trivia reveal as I go over these. So, oh shoot, I don't actually... I have to go on the move for a second right now because I forgot my answer key because I can't memorize all these things. I know how hard they are. Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to start with the first question, which is um, another name for what baby bats are. Now, these, this would be C, pups, is the other name for baby bats. Then, well, all kinds of incredibly hot chili peppers. I couldn't stand any of these here. But the hottest pepper, the hottest known pepper in the world, which one is that? That's the Carolina Reaper. For the third one, quantum entanglement, already spooky sounding enough, is an interesting phenomena in which one particle affects another, seemingly unrelated particle, and has been given this name, spooky action at a distance. <laughs> I hope by now I should pick up on a theme going on here. So the Cantor function, we got a math trivia question here, also known as what is an example of a function that's continuous but also not? So this is the Devil's Staircase. Ominous. Now, for the fifth one, Maxwell's Demon is a fun experiment which made to hypothetically violate the first, the second, the third, or the federal law of thermodynamics. It's not a, a, a trick for tax evasion, it's actually the second law of thermodynamics. So, in equivalent to writing QED, some uh, Latin phrase, which isn't coming to me right now, to signify the end of a mathematical proof, is to use which of these characters? Is it the tombstone, the dagger, the obelisk? It's the tombstone. It's just like a little box. Now, well, this is a long one. Devil's Corkscrews, we're going straight into the spooky theme for October, where the strange heli- uh, helical geological features found throughout the North American Badlands, and what were they eventually realized to be? These were actually the burrows of uh, Paleocaster, an extinct species of tiny beavers. <laughs> now, at the time of the making these burrows, I'm sure they weren't extinct, but you know, nowadays, uh, old places, especially if you think about the Victorian age of things, was where all the ghosts come from. Uh, well, anyways, where, where is the, which country houses the oldest library in the world? Meaning it must be the most haunted, of course. You know, old meaning haunted. Uh, 
It's Morocco, fun fact. Now, moving on, John Napier was rumored to have an affinity for the occult, specifically necromancy, divinations, and alchemy. Uh, but what was his discovery? What did he actually contribute besides, you know, work in necromancy? This is the inventor of the logarithm. It's a fun little mathematical function. I'm sure he discovered things related to alchemy as well, but, you know, we're talking math right now and science, so... <laughs> and then there's this terrifying species of fungus that can latch on to an insect host, burrow its way into the brain of the insect or the nervous system, and basically turn it into a zombie. What's the name of this fungus? This is C. Cordyceps, unilateralis. Ophiocordyceps. And so, we have, once again in Tap Talk's tradition, a uh, tie for first place. And so we're going to have a tiebreaker question now. And so, tie for first with two people. We have uh, Zach G. and Elizabeth Vandergriff come on up for this tiebreaker question. Um, I need a microphone. Ah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> So could Zach and Elizabeth come on up to the stage? All right. Okay, so the trivia question today, we're gonna stick with the theme here. So Carl Heist is responsible for growing the largest pumpkin ever recorded, weighing in at how many pounds? I'm gonna say 500. 500 pounds? 300. And 300 pounds. Now, as it turns out, the largest pumpkin ever recorded was 2,517 pounds. That's a big pumpkin. So, if you both could get Elizabeth up first, a round of applause, Zach second. Now, you two can both go to the table in the back over there and collect the prizes, Elizabeth getting first choice, Zach second. And we also had Three people tie for third, fourth, and fifth places. Now, we don't have a tiebreaker for you all, but you can all, the three of you can go to the back and get your prizes too. Uh, so, Alex Foley, Sophie Graff, and Joel Roberts. A little round of applause for them. Now, now we have the raffle, and so for that I'm gonna go to the back so I can get those raffle tickets, and we can find out who's the winner of the raffle. Thank you, Jackie. So if you took advantage of that last little moment of time. <laughs> so, could, whoops, sorry, the owner of the ticket number 2586832. Two, five, oh, that right here. <laughs> all right. Well, Thank you all for coming out tonight. I hope you had a great time. Uh, we'll have another event right here in just three weeks' time. So thank you to all of our speakers. Can I get one last round of applause from everybody? And also, thank you to all the Tap Talks volunteers who make this possible. I, I couldn't do it without them. So I want to thank them as well. <laughs> um, all right, have a great night, everybody.